Okay, if you could turn with me, please, this morning in your Bibles to the book of Ezekiel in the third chapter, and we're going to read from verse 16 down to verse 27, the end of the chapter. So chapter 3, verse 16, down to verse 27. We have a very simple title this morning. It's The Watchman. It's all about Ezekiel being a watchman for the house of Israel. And, of course, uh, it has been stated that Ezekiel is the prophet of human responsibility. So we'll think a little bit about that as we consider these things. So it begins verse 16. And it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way, to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood shall I will I require at thine hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die, because thou hast not given him warning. He shall die in his sin, and his righteousness, which he hath done, shall not be remembered. But his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man, that the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live, because he is warned. Also thou hast delivered thy soul. And the hand of the Lord was there upon me. And he said unto me, Arise, go forth into the plain, and I will there talk with thee. Then I arose and went forth into the plain, and behold, the glory of the Lord stood there as the glory which I saw by the river of Keba, and I fell on my face. Then the Spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet and spoke with me. And said unto me, Go, shut thyself within thine house. But thou, O son of man, behold, they shall put bands upon thee, and shall bind thee with them, and thou shalt not go out among them. And I will make thy tongue cleave to the roof of thy mouth, that thou shalt be dumb, and shalt not be to them a reprover, but they are a rebellious house. But when I speak with thee, I will open thy mouth, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, He that heareth, let him hear, and he that forbeareth, let him forbear, for they are a rebellious house. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us this morning. So this image of a watchman, which we're going to be thinking of here. So he is appointed by God to be a watchman to the house of Israel. And of course, the watchman, uh, as we discussed last time, they're uh, really sentries, we would say today. They're put on on the walls of the city. Uh, their, their job is to scan the horizon, and if an enemy is approaching, uh, then they are to blow the trumpet, as it were, and sound the warning so that people can be prepared rather than caught unawares. Of course, if the watchman fails to warn, why might he do that? Well, he might fall asleep on sentry duty, for instance. Uh, as a result of that, um, God will hold that watchman responsible for those that perish. So that's the thought, the general thought of a watchman. And it's interesting, I have a dear friend, he was uh, uh, served in the U.S. military in Vietnam, and he remembers one night uh, while he was in Vietnam, there was a terrible gunshot uh, ran out on the on the camp where they were, and it turned out that uh, one of the South Korean guards had fallen asleep on sentry duty, and his officer had shot him <laughs> for negligence of duty. And so quite a serious thing. And so, again, we just want to think about being the watchman. Uh, and, of course, he was a watchman. Now, let's just look at how it's used in Scripture. I want to just see that this is a common thing in the Old Testament, but also uh, it does bleed through into the New Testament. We'll see a couple of examples as we proceed today. But let's go to uh, the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 21. Isaiah 21, and uh, <clears throat> this might be just a refresher for a lot, but it's good to be reminded. 21 verse 11 and 12, the burden of Duma, he called 
calleth to me out of Seir, Watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? The watchman said, The morning cometh, and also the night. If you will inquire, inquire you, return, come. I heard a man preach a gospel message on watchman, what of the night many years ago. And of course, uh, of course, it's good to remind people, what of the night? The night's coming when no man can work. And so watchman, what of the night? Uh, Isaiah 62 and verse 6. And once more, we have this idea of a watchman. I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day nor night. Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence. So again, watchmen on the walls, uh, and of course they're meant to speak uh, in the light of impending danger. A couple from the Psalms, we want to look at well-known verses. Uh, Psalm 127, <clears throat> very significant psalm in many ways. It says this, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. We're very familiar with that scripture. And then it says this, except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. In other words, ultimately, the Lord is in control of the safety of the city. And as we will see, because Israel, uh, as we proceed into chapter four, had sinned against God, he had removed his protection from them. And so, again, except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Even if he warns them, uh, if God has removed his protection, uh, even with warning, they're not going to be able to uh, resist the enemy. And so, again, ultimately dependent on the Lord. Psalm 130 and verse 6, he says, My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. I suppose if you're a watchman, the hardest time to be a watchman is the night hours because you're fighting your natural tendency to fall asleep. And of course, you, your eyes are strained to see because often an enemy comes in a time of darkness. So it's, it's, and so the watchman, he, he's looking for the morning. He, uh, in a sense, there's a relief if you're on sentry duty and you see the morning light appear. <laughs> uh, it makes your job easier. You finish your night shift. And so he says, I wait for the Lord, just like the watchman waits for the morning with that eager anticipation. That's the thought that's being conveyed. Uh, one more reference, uh, at least for now, uh, on this idea of watchman. I want to look at the book of Isaiah once more. But this time, I want to look at uh, a verse in Isaiah 56, which is a very challenging verse. Isaiah 56, verse 10, if the other ones are not challenging enough, this one is very challenging. He says uh, in Isaiah 56 and verse 10, his watchmen are blind. So that's not much of a watchman, is it? If he's supposed to be watching for the enemy and he's blind, he's not going to be much help. The wa his watchmen are blind. They're all ignorant. They're all dumb dogs. They cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Because this is an indictment on the leadership of Israel, who should have been watching. Uh, but he says they were blind and they were worse than dumb dogs that could not bark. And again, it's like having a, uh, a, a guard dog that can't bark. <laughs> Uh, he's just an unnecessary expense. <laughs> he's just a waste of space to have a guard dog that cannot park. And so uh, that's the tragedy. Um, of course, they're laying down, loving to slumber. They like to sleep. Sadly, most of the prophets of Israel were blind, ignorant, and like dumb dogs. They couldn't bark a warning. In fact, they often would prophesy peace when there was no peace. Uh, these we call them false prophets. They had a soothing message when a warning message would have been much more appropriate. And so just this thought of the watchman. So we, we get to Ezekiel and, and we learn of his accountability here. He says in verse 17, I've made you a watchman to the house of Israel. He says, therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. So again, he gets a message from God. He now has to deliver that message as he has received it to warn them from him. So he's warning from the Lord about 
the approach of the enemy about coming destruction. So then, in verse 18 through 21, we're going to learn about his accountability as a watchman. And there are four different scenarios that are played out before us in these verses 18 through 21. The first one is when the watchman fails to warn the wicked. And so we'll notice, he says in verse 18, When I say to the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thy end. It's what often is known as blood guiltiness. You, the watchman, are culpable because you failed to warn the wicked of uh, the need of repentance. So clearly the scenario is impending judgment from an invading army. Of course, directly, this invading army is connected with the iniquity of the people. Uh, the, the, the people's iniquity has brought about judgment from God. And uh, they're, they're under attack, and the only way that they could stave off defeat is by repentance. The prophets of God were meant to be the watchmen, calling the people to repent and return to their covenant responsibilities before God. And again, as we saw in Psalm 127.1, even if the watchman uh, warns the city, uh, but if the law doesn't keep it, it's all in vain. And so repentance was so necessary. Uh, even if the watchman did wake up and faithfully warn the people, uh, they would be defenseless against the enemy if they did not repent. In other words, God protected his people, and the judgments came because of their sin and their failure. As the Lord was the one who kept the city, he would gave it over to judgment if they were unrepentant. There was nothing they could do about it. But notice here, um, it's more the individual that's in view here, not the nation as a whole. Corporate failure is already pretty total. But Ezekiel is to warn individuals, to warn the wicked. Uh, and so that's his responsibility. And so individual faithfulness is in view. Again, we said that if he fails to warn, uh, then th their blood would be required at his hands. Now, I want you to notice, let's go back to this phrase uh, that is mentioned here. His blood will I require at thine hand. I want us to go back to Genesis 9, where the principle of first mention the first time that thought is conveyed to us is the introduction of corporal punishment uh, by God uh, after the flood. And he says, um, and surely, uh, this is uh, Genesis 9 verse 5, surely your blood of your lives will I require, at the hand of every beast will I require it, and the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, I require the life of man. Whomsoever sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. So that's where the idea of blood guiltiness is concerned. You kill somebody, you forfeit your life, right? You're guilty of what we call murder, uh, first-degree murder. And you know, at least at this time, Genesis 9, the, the result of that was the death penalty. It was equated with, at least here, we would say that the failure of the watchman to warn is equated with murder by negligence. He failed to warn the wicked. And because of that, uh, God will hold him accountable. Now, I want you to look at the New Testament now. We said that there's some correlation in the New Testament, and we see it particularly in the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And twice we'll, we'll hear him say this about him being free of blood guiltiness. And so Acts 18 in verse 6, uh, of course he's preaching in the synagogue in Corinth, and it says in verse 6, And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. 
from henceforth, I will go into the Gentiles. In other words, I have faithfully carried out my ministry as a watchman. And I have warned you, <laughs> and you've rejected the message of Christ the Savior. And as a result of that, uh, my hands are clean. Uh, I have no response. I've discharged my responsibility, and it's up to you now. You're responsible, and you have rejected that message. When we get to chapter 20 of Acts, again, verse 6. <clears throat> Sorry, verse 26. 20, verse 26. He says, Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. Wow, what a what a statement. And so he could say without question that he's he has discharged his responsibility. He has warned men them. Of course, we read in, in that very chapter, he warned men night and day with tears. He took his responsibility as a watchman very, very serious. So that's scenario number one. Now Scenario uh, number two is verse 19. It says, Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. This time the watchman has been faithful, but there has not been a response. They have, in a sense, ignored the warnings of the watchman. And, of course, the watchman's free. He's pure from their blood. He's done his responsibility, but they will die in their sin as a result of their failure to heed his message and to repent. Now, why don't you go back with me, please, just for a second to Jeremiah. Kind of interesting in Jeremiah 6, verse 17. We read this. It says, Also I set watchmen over you, saying, Hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, We will not hearken so god had faithfully set up watchmen and they had blown the trumpet the trumpet was a sound of an alarm uh, right and god had, had done this uh, used his prophets to do it but it says they said we will not hearken <laughs> we will not hearken i suppose that it's kind of like in our area um we have uh these tornado sirens that go off and uh, we had one just a few weeks ago and actually several times during the night the, there was a tornado seen in the area and so once the warning was given we were responsible uh, to respond to that to find shelter to to go in a and it's very easy you know when you've had three in one night get to the third one you, and nothing's happened the previous two times it's very easy to say yeah not not just turn over and go back to sleep and again we'd be culpable if we <laughs> we would would die so the idea is let pay attention to the warnings of god and so here we have scenario number three now in verse 20 and he says again when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity and i lay a stumbling block before him he shall die because thou hast not given him warning he shall die in his sin and his righteousness, which he had done, shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require thine hand. Now, this time, it's a failure uh, on the part of the watchman to warn the man who has previously had uh, a testimony of walking in righteousness, but he's turned from that and he's committed iniquity. And so what that would tell us is that the warning of the watchman should not just be for the wicked, but it also should be towards the righteous who might be tempted to kind of feel like they've got enough brownie points with God that they can kind of let their guard down and go into iniquity. And so what we just have to recognize, the watchman not only is to warn sinners to repent and return to the covenant, but also those who are keeping the covenant to stay faithful faithful and not undo what has been done by turning to sin and the, the thought is very simple isn't it that that um a, kind of a sad verse in a sense because it says that because this guy has turned away from righteousness and he's gone into iniquity it says 
He shall die in his sin, and his righteousness, which he hath done, shall not be remembered. And it's kind of a sad thing, isn't it, that a person can have, a, have had a good testimony for a number of years, and then um, they fall into sin, and the tendency of us as human beings is not to remember all the good that he did, but to remember that he failed, <laughs> and to remember how he failed, right? That's that's kind of the tendency of the human heart, and God says this is what's going to happen here. So this righteous man turned from his righteousness <clears throat> and did evil, and then it says, and this is kind of a very interesting verse, it says, again in verse 20, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sin. So this idea of laying a stumbling block before him is a very interesting thought, isn't it? Now, the stumbling block was not placed by God deliberately to cause the righteous to fall into sin because he'd already fallen into sin. But it was an obstacle set in the path of this man to see if he would continue to respond to God. In other words, God is giving in him a sense, a, an opportunity, is putting a difficulty in his way that will make him turn back. But in this instance, sadly, uh, he failed to respond. And if he fell, then the result would be physical death. So those charged with declaring God's word have a weighty responsibility, not only to warn the wicked, but to warn the righteous to keep on being faithful to the Lord. Now, we have to say this because this uh, passage has been used uh, by some to say that there's no such thing as eternal security. And so we've got to kind of get a right perspective of what's going on here. This life and death, the death of the wicked or he shall live, is not, in context not to be understood as eternal life or eternal death, but it's really physical death that's in view. The concept of life and death in the Mosaic Covenant is primarily physical in other words if you keep the covenant then you will experience a long and prosperous life if you fail to keep the covenant god will chastise and that may include premature death and so the mosaic covenant was to guide those who already had entered into a relationship with god by faith and uh, again it was a relationship they entered into and if they failed then there would be consequences. So let's give an example of this. Uh, let's go book back to Leviticus. And we'll look at a, a couple of examples that might help us to see what we're saying here. That This is not talking about eternal separation from God here. We are, to, Although in the case of some, it, it could be. If they had no faith, it could be eternal separate. But, but really in context, it's talking about physical death, the failure to keep the covenant. So let's look at examples. Leviticus chapter 18 And verse 5, it says, You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. Okay? And keeping his statutes, he shall live in them. Look at Deuteronomy. So the pro prolonging of physical life. <clears throat> verse 37, Deuteronomy 4, verse 37 <clears throat> and because, um, yeah, 437, because he loved thy fathers, therefore he chose their seed after them and brought thee out in his sight with his mighty power out of Egypt to drive out the nations from before thee greater and mightier than thou art to bring thee in to give thee their land for an inheritance as it is this day. Know therefore this day and consider it in thine heart that the Lord, he is God in heaven and above and above and upon the earth beneath, there is none else. Thou shalt keep therefore his statutes and his commandments, which I commanded thee this day, that it may go well with thee and with thy children after thee, and that thou mayest prolong thy days upon the earth 
which the Lord thy God giveth thee forever. Okay, so long, longevity of life would result in keeping these covenants and statutes that God had given. The Hebrew could live righteously and freely by keeping these commandments. If he failed, there would be consequences, and those consequences would include physical death and all kinds of other uh, issues. You see the list of things that God would bring upon them for failure to keep the covenant in Deuteronomy 28, a very fascinating patch, passage. But if they disobeyed, physical death resulting in a shortened life was the normal result. One other reference in Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30, and we'll read from verse 15. See, I've set before thee this day life and, and good and death and evil, in that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, thou shalt be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them. I denounce unto you this day that you shall surely perish, and that you shall not prolong your days upon the land, whither thou passest over Jordan, to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day again, against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave to him, for he is thy life in the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give them. So the emphasis is clearly living a righteous life, would be rewarded by longevity. Failure to live a righteous life would include the idea of discipline and premature death. So we're saying eternal security is not really the issue in this passage. Again, sometimes it's dangerous to read New Testament light back into Old Testament passages where it's a completely different scenario. But we can say, practically speaking, that in the New Testament, we do know whom the Lord loves, he chastens. So his chastening hand is upon those he loves. And we see in Corinth, there were those who had been chastened by the Lord, and including premature death. But also, we could say this, that <clears throat> the warning here is that this righteous man, all the righteousness that he had done... <laughs> Before he began to commit iniquity, it says, it shall not be remembered. And again, there's a, there's a danger, isn't there, that a, that a person's testimony over many years can be spoiled by falling into iniquity. And so it's a warning to all of us. We don't want that to be the case. And again, in this scenario, remember, uh, the righteous man, he commits iniquity, and, and it says, because thou hast not given him warning, there was a failure to warn this righteous man. And so, again, what we could say practically, how we can, how can we apply this practically, that in our ministry, there always should be a warning note, both to the, the wicked, that they turn from their wicked ways, but also to the righteous, uh, that whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And the importance of staying close to the Lord, enjoying a close walk with him, uh, those things should be brought before the saints uh, as a warning. Note, there are serious consequences. So scenario number four now, and that's verse 21. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live because he is warned. Also, thou hast delivered his soul or his life. And so he, he is warned and he responds to the warning and he keeps the covenant and he's rewarded accordingly with long life. And again, we say sometimes it's possible to get the idea that because we have been walking faithfully with the Lord for a long time, maybe we've earned a bit of slack and uh, 
and we can we can kind of get a little bit wayward and we need to be aware that the new testament also has this strong warning as a mandate to warn both the unsaved to repent of their sins but also warn the saints of the consequence of sin and the lord's chastening and let's give a couple of examples uh, of this we, we've already mentioned hebrews but let me just read the actual scripture and it's a it's a very significant scripture hebrews 12 in verse 6 it says for whom the lord loveth and of course it's a mark of his love right he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth uh, if you endure chastening god deals with you as with sons and go he goes on and talks about that so let's say again the lord's chastening um james chapter 5 it says uh, in verse 19 brethren if you do if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him or restore him let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his ways shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sin again this warning note uh, again preserving from chastening and even divine discipline now having talked about ezekiel as a watchman now we have a very interesting scenario from verse 22 down to verse 27 and it's concerning ezekiel's muteness and his lockdown uh, this this uh, should resonate with us uh, so he says in verse 22 it says and the hand of the lord was there upon me and he said to me arise go forth into the plain and i will there talk with thee the first thing he's told to uh, to go forth to a plain and uh, of course the word plain here has the idea of cleft or opening so he sent to receive uh, an open valley to receive further instructions from god uh, the hand of the lord being upon him we've already noticed this is the actually the, the third time we read about the hand of the lord being upon him so he, again he's subject to both divine authority and filled with divine power god's hand is upon this man uh, what a wonderful thing when the lord's hand is upon his servants rather than against his servants but on his servants in this case uh, and so he sent to receive further instructions and then it says verse 23 then i arose and went forth into the plain and behold the glory of the lord stood there as the glory which i saw by the river of kiba and I fell upon my face. Once again, he's given a glimpse of the glory of the Lord, which he had seen in chapter one. And the result of it is that he falls on his face, just as he did the previous occasion and will do in all subsequent occasions. And so it, again, it, it's, it, it's just, he's consistent. He always falls on his face when he sees the glory of God. We could say this, that in Ezekiel's case, familiarity, did not breed contempt <laughs> when he saw the glory of god he fell on his face and uh, he, he had a sense of awe at the presence of divine glory what a sight it must have been for him to see the glory of the lord and again allow him to just keep this at the back of his mind this is why their turning to idolatry was such a serious serious thing they'd exchange as we've already said and we're going to re-emphasize it as we go through they they made a deliberate conscious choice to change the glory of god and worship the created thing instead of the glory of the creator what a tragedy and so verse 24 it says then the spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet and spake with me and said unto me go shut thyself within thy house so over this these verses the next few verses it could be rendered this ecclesiastes 3 7 says a time to rend a time to sow a time to keep silence and a time to speak and that's exactly what's going to happen with our prophet for the most of the next uh, few years he is going to be a, a mute man confined to his house. And the only time he speaks is when God 
gives him a message to speak. And so he, this will be a man who has a time to stay silent <laughs> and a time to speak. And it's going to be very, very obvious. So the first thing he says, go shut thyself within thy house. So it seems that the prophet's ministry for the next few years is going to be a private one limited to those who would come to the prophet's house. And so this is what he's done. He's he's going to be in this house. Notice verse 25, it says, uh, But thou, O son of man, behold, they shall put bands upon thee and shall bind thee with them, and thou shalt not go out among them. So clearly very restricted. He's bound to his house. And it says they shall. Now, we, we're not sure who the they is. Uh, there are lots of suggestions who the, they could be. It could be that the people themselves didn't uh, didn't want to hear his warning message, so they made him a prisoner in his own house and tied him up. But it seems the sense here is that God is the one that's telling him to stay in his house. And maybe he had someone bind him as an object lesson. And so here he is, uh, basically, uh, in his house and... Think about this. He's going to be there for seven and a half years. He's going to be in his house until the fall of Jerusalem in Ezekiel 24, verse 25 through 27, and only come out when God tells him to. Now, we know a little bit about lockdowns and how difficult a lockdown can be. Imagine seven and a half years in your house and you can't speak even, <laughs> not even small talk or chit chat, unless God gives you a message. We, we think of what these prophets endured <laughs> in many ways. I mean, they, they paid a real price for their commitment to the Lord. And so he's going to spend seven and a half years until Ezekiel 24. Let me just go there for a minute. Ezekiel 24, verse 25 through 27, where we read this. Also, thou son of man, shall it not be in the day when I take from them their strength, the joy of their glory, the desire of their eyes, that whereupon they set their minds, their sons and their daughters, that he that escapeth in the day shall come unto thee to cause thee to hear it with thine ears, in that day shall thy mouth be opened to him which is escaped, and thou shalt speak, and be no more dumb, and thou shalt be a sign unto them, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So mute, dumb, until Ezekiel 24, verse 27, when one that escapes will come and tell thee, cause you to hear about the destruction of Jerusalem. And... um. So he's basically withdrawn from the exiles and muted by God for this seven and a half years and, and only allowed to speak what God tells him. So he's bound, he's in his house. Verse 26, I will make thy tongue cleave to the roof of thy mouth that thou shalt be dumb and shall not be to them a reprover but they are a rebellious house. His tongue cleaving to it, the roof of his mouth, and um, he is basically going to be dumb for these seven and a half years unless God gives him a message. No small talk, no giving of his own opinions or trivial conversations. He could only speak the words that God told him to do and when God told him to do it. For seven and a half years. It's hard for us to comprehend this. I, I don't know, maybe you find see, but to me, I just find this, that would be a tremendous trial. We talk about needing the power of the Holy Spirit to speak the word of God, but perhaps sometimes we need the power of the Holy Spirit to know when to keep quiet. It's interesting that Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19 says this, in the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin. That was said by supposedly the wisest man that ever lived. In the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin. 
And so I, I think it's true to say sometimes we need to speak. We, we, we need to be a watchman <laughs> rather than a dumb dog. We need to warn. But sometimes we just be better off if we didn't say something. And uh, I think of Job's comforters as an example. They did a great job until they opened their mouths. <laughs> the minute they opened their mouths, everything went south. And so sometimes it's good to be quiet. Israel, it seems, initially uh, rejected him, but later, we'll see as we go through, the elders of Israel would sneak away to the prophet's house to inquire of God for his workings. And so he's to be silent in the house for this seven and a half years. But then he says, verse 27, When I speak with thee, I will open thy mouth. Thou shalt say to them, Thus saith the Lord God, He that heareth, let him hear. He that forbeareth, let him forbear, for they are a rebellious house. So again, there will be times when God will open his mouth and will speak through him. Now, again, in our day, there's no such restraint placed upon us. In fact, Paul prays in Ephesians 6, so we know it well, verses 19 and 20, he says this, And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for I am an ambassador in bonds, and therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And so there's a time for us to really say, Lord, I need boldness. And I think it's true of all of us. Sometimes we don't speak when we ought to speak, and sometimes it would be better if our tongues clave to our jaws and we could not speak. And we need the Lord's help. Yeah, the psalmist prayed about, put a guard over my lips that I sin not against thee. And certainly we need help in this area. Now, uh, we in the remaining time, we're going to jump over into chapter 4. And we've got, a, again, a very fascinating chapter. And it, it's, if I could signify what it's about really it's war games and then ezekiel bread those two things war games and ezekiel bread one thing for sure is god not only spoke through ezekiel but he also makes him to be a sign to the house of israel in other words he's kind of a an acting prophet he's he's his life um and various illustrations that he will give physically will be used as a sign to the house of Israel. So notice verse 3 uh, of chapter 4, it says, Moreover, take thou unto thee an iron pan, and set it for a wall of iron between thee and the city, and set thy face against it, and it shall be besieged, and thou shalt lay siege against it. This shall be a sign to the house of Israel. So again, the war game scenario, we'll talk about it in a minute, that he plays out, uh, that Ezekiel is acting out, is meant to be a sign to the house of Israel. Look at chapter 12 of Ezekiel, verse 6. In their sight shalt thou carry it upon thy shoulders, and carry it forth in the twilight. Thou shalt cover thy face, and thou shalt not, uh, thou sh that thou see not the ground. For I have set thee for a sign unto the house of Israel, set you for a sign. Ezekiel 24 again, we were just there a few minutes ago. Verse 24, thus Ezekiel is unto you a sign. Ezekiel 24, 24, according to all that he hath done shall you do. And when this cometh, you shall know that I am the Lord God. So the prophet is himself a sign. So that perhaps explains a lot of the muteness because he's he's in a sense going to be speaking without words he's going to be using actions but occasionally god will give him a message that he will deliver and that he will speak and so we're going to find the prophet performing in the next few chapters 12 action sermons to convey god's truth to a people who were becoming increasingly deaf to the voice of God. It's almost as if they weren't listening to the preached word anymore. So God says, okay, I am going to use this actor prophet. And by, let me just say this, that um, because there's, today there's, a, there's a, a, a drama trend that is entering into the church. 
in, not in assemblies, thankfully, that I know of, but it certainly is uh, entering into evangelicalism as, as a whole and uh, drama skits and all this kind of thing. What we can say is that when God has to do this kind of thing, like he does from Ezekiel, it's a sign of divine judgment that they're not listening to the word of God anymore. It's not a positive thing. It's a very negative thing. It's, it means that they've stopped listening to the plain preached word. And that's certainly what was the case in Ezekiel. So maybe this will highlight it and give you a, a, a thought, the idea of the thought. When we, we find the, um, when Pharaoh would not listen, God spoke through plagues. Okay. In other words, he had, the men wouldn't listen to the entreaties of Moses, and God had a way of speaking, and he spoke through plagues. When the house of Israel would not listen, he sent pictures, this man acting out these dramas, if you like. When the Pharisees would not listen, the Lord Jesus started to speak in parables. <laughs> and so usually when we get to this stage, it's it's because people have stopped listening to the voice of God. God, again, showing his faithfulness, going to every length, goes above and beyond and does further things to get people's attention. And so this, this is where we're at. Uh, they're not really listening to the voice of God anymore. God is now in judgment, speaking through these pictures. And these pictures are all, this chapter, it's about the siege of Jerusalem. That is, hasn't happened yet, but it's going to happen. It's a, it's a picture, if you like, a picture parable of the coming siege of Jerusalem. And so from chapter 4 through chapter 24 covers the period of seven and a half years from Ezekiel's call to the beginning of the siege of Jerusalem. So this is the section we're really in now. So verses 1 through 3, uh, we'll think a little bit about the siege. And so let me just read those verses again. Verse 1, thou, thou also, son of man, take thee a tile and lay it before thee and portray upon it the city, even Jerusalem, and lay siege against it, build a fort against it, cast a mount against it, set the camp also against it, and set battering rams against it round about. Moreover, take thou unto thee an iron pan, and set it for a wall of iron between thee and the city, and set thy face against it, and it shall be besieged, and thou shalt lay siege against it. This shall be a sign to the house of Israel." So this is a sign of the coming siege. Now, it, it was very hard enough for the exiles to find themselves in captivity. However, Ezekiel's message is that they won't be going back to Jerusalem. They'll have no city to go back to, at least for 70 years. Uh, we're gonna, we'd learn that from Jeremiah. But some of them uh, still had hope that this was only temporary, and that they would, and especially the false prophets were telling them, oh, this was just a temporary thing and they'll be going back. They're going back to the city. And uh, th there would be a miraculous deliverance that would be affected for them. And it would be the Egyptians who would bring this deliverance. So this siege shows that it's futile. Their whole thought of going back is a futile thing. Jerusalem, the very place they're thinking we're going home to, is also going to be under siege to the Babylonians and will fall through that siege. But first will be this siege. So he says, Son of man, take thee a tile, verse 1, lay it before thee, portray upon the city, even Jerusalem. Because they have been from Babylon, from Iraq, they've found these clay plates or tablets or even clay bricks with uh, drawings on them, inscriptions on them. This is the idea, things etched on them. So Ezekiel was to etch a picture of the city of Jerusalem on a clay brick tile or tablet. Now, we must imagine that the strange actions that Ezekiel was now told to perform were to be carried out either just inside his house or most likely on the open space in front of his doorway. 
Because remember, he's confined to base. <laughs> so he's not walking through the city doing this. So he's, he, the, the picture is that he's probably lying out in his front yard of his house, still under lockdown, and he's playing war games. You see, the actions he's conveying would be pointless unless they could be watched by a large number of people. And so although he's confined, this is how the scenario most likely played out. Verse 2, and lay siege against it and build a fort against it, cast a mountain against it, set the camp also against it, battering rams against it round about. So basically, he, he's laying out kind of like children who would play with toy soldiers and they'd have... Uh, We've had some of our grandchildren playing with toy soldiers this week, and they've been using some of my library books to build kind of ramparts and all kinds of things. And and uh, so this is what they're doing. But this is not children doing it. This is a grown man, a prophet of God, building siege mounds, ramparts, forts, towers for archers, siege engines, all the rest of it. And what he's doing is conveying this message and the real message is this, that the Babylonians are going to lay siege and that would be fulfilled. This siege would be fulfilled in 588 BC when the Babylonian army would begin the siege of the city. So he's just conveying that simple message. Verse 3, moreover, take that one to thee, an iron pan, and set it for a wall of iron between thee and the city. So Ezekiel was to get this this iron pan. It'd be a flat iron pan, a griddle uh, that would would have been used by the priests, for instance, uh, to to cook the meal offering. Uh, he's a priest. Maybe he had one of those very utensils. But that's the idea. A uh, kind of a flat. Uh, we have really a nice flat iron griddle pan that we use for cooking bacon and. Uh, uh, often on a Friday morning after preaching, that's my next task is to crack the pan and put the bacon on. But anyway, a flat iron pan, a kind of utensil the priests used in the temple preparing the grain offering, it had a twofold significance. First of all, it was going to represent the impenetrable wall of the besieging army, showing the severity of the siege and the impossibility of escape. Once this siege began, no escape. Secondly, it symbolized the wall that stood between God and the Jewish nation so that he could no longer look upon them with approval or blessing because of their sin. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Psalm 66, 18. This is where Israel were at. Despite the siege, their cries were going to go unheard. God was not going to listen to them. Ezekiel could no longer pronounce to them the priestly blessing of Numbers chapter 6. Numbers chapter 6, let me just read this priestly blessing. Remember, he's Ezekiel the priest, and uh, he just couldn't do this. Uh, 24 through 26, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. They shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. That could not be done anymore because God was no longer, his face was no longer shining toward them, but he was against them because they were such a rebellious house. Look at chapter 5 of Ezekiel, verse 8. says this, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, am against thee, and will execute judgment in the midst of thee in the sight of the nations. And so this pan was saying that now there's th there's this barrier between them and God because of their iniquity. He could no longer look upon them with approval or blessing. In fact, he was against them. Well, that's a nice place to, to end before we get into him laying on his left side and on his right side and, and then him baking is bread. We'll have to leave that till next time. May the Lord encourage us with these thoughts. Amen.